Hi everyone, I hope you're all doing okay. Um, I am excited this week to share another week with my notebooks video for, with you. Um, this is a video I've made once before um, and I thought I would do it again because it was fun and I was kind of feeling it. I think it would be nice if this was like another uh, like unofficial, I guess, series for the channel. Um, unofficial in the sense that there'll be no schedule, I'll just make them when I feel like it. Um, and this week I felt like it, so here we are. I'm gonna answer some questions again like I did last time so that I don't have to try and find like 40 minutes worth of background music, um, but if you want to mute the audio and listen to your own music in the background and journal along with me, that's fine too. Um, and other than that, I hope you enjoy. I'm gonna answer some questions. Um, we've actually had some construction work today, <laughs> um, for the last couple of days actually, but like on and off, but today it was really bad. Um, and I'm really hoping it's gonna stay quiet because it's now Friday night, basically, and I'm trying to last minute record the audio. Um, it's been so loud. Um, Wednesday is a wreck, poor thing, like, understandably. It's just been a lot to deal with. Um, last night, they started construction again at like 8 p.m., so I'm desperately filming this at half past six, hoping they're gonna stay quiet because the noise has been unbelievable. Um, at the beginning of every week, I write out my monthly pages in my Hobonichi. Um, that's what I'm starting to do here. I think before this, I just updated my monthly page a little bit, but I'm writing out my trackers for the week. Um, I track habits in the top, and then under that, I have a task master list for the week. Um, my task master list is just a way for me to have one long to-do list that I can work on over multiple days. Being autistic means that sometimes I can't finish a task in one day, but I can start it. And even small tasks can take me a couple of days to finish um, or to like complete properly, I guess. Um, I normally chip away at things quite gradually. So that's why this method works well for me, I guess. Um, so you'll see me working on that. I get my stickers out <laughs> um, and I try to decorate the pages. Um, I, I work it out eventually, but I always have a lot of back and forth. Every time I make one of these videos, I'm struck by just how long I spend faffing about where to place stickers. I cut out like 10 minutes of footage every time. It's absurd. Um, but I decorate my pages. 
these pages I dip in and out of throughout the week. Um, sometimes I'll check in every day and other weeks I will just do it every couple of days or sometimes only twice a week to update it. Um, I really set it up and then use it as and when I need it. I'm not super strict about it. Um, which leads me on to the first question. How are you able to start journaling? I'm trying to get into commonplacing to help with my memory, but I can't remember to do it lol. I'm curious how you were able to get started. And this is a question that I think I did answer in the previous video, but I'll answer it again because a lot of people were interested. Um, it was a common question, so uh, I'll talk about it. Um, I've been journaling and keeping books of all kinds since I was a kid. I think in the last episode, I mentioned that when I was a kid in school, I would steal blank books from, from the cupboards, the stationary cupboards, to use them at home. Um, so I've always had the compulsion to be writing and to be collecting information and documenting things, um, even as a really young kid. I think it's maybe an impulse that a lot of kids have, but it's something that a lot of people grow out of. Um, and I guess it would be interesting to wonder how phones affect that now. Um, do kids have to carry notebooks around when they have their phones to store information in? I haven't thought about that and now I'm like <laughs> having a small existential crisis, oh my god. Okay, but your question. It's a habit I've always had, so I haven't personally had to work very hard for it, but if I could recommend anything to you, it would be to pick a time of day to work on it. A habit and a routine can't be formed out of nowhere. You have to find a slot for it in your life and then you have to work to keep to keep up with that. So I would pick a time of day and commit to it for at least a week and see how you feel. You might find that after just a week it starts to come a bit more naturally to you, but if you're just planning to do it randomly every now and then, I think you're going to find it very hard to sit down and get started. Um, so, so that's my advice <laughs> for the first question, is just to sit down, pick a time, commit to it just for a week, and then see how you feel. Um, and hopefully by that point the routine will be forming itself and it will feel more natural. I'm not gonna lie, Tuesday was a weird day for me. I was having, not a bad day, but I was having a weird time with my notebooks. On Monday evening and Monday night, I was drawing ghosts in my sketchbook and posting them on Tumblr and having a laugh with people. And then when I woke up on Tuesday, I was still hyper-focused on my ghost drawings. Um, so when it came to filming clips for this video and actually picking up my notebooks to update things, I was struggling a bit. Um, I wasn't in the mood, I guess, and so I was having a really hard time making anything feel like it worked. I was trying to decorate my February pages, which I thought would be really fun and easy. And instead, I was just over obsessing about how the stickers on the colors looked and everything. And I was getting quite, like, not stressed about it, but a little bit stressed about it. Um, eventually, it did pull together. And then I started, I think, maybe working in my commonplace book as well. Um, and eventually that pulled together too. So I was having a weird time, <laughs> um, but I think it did pull together. Um, the next question, which is relevant to what's currently on screen. I don't know if you have alexithymia or trouble processing feelings in general, but if you do relate, do you have any specific things you do or have to make it easier for yourself? Um, and what you saw me doing a couple of seconds ago on the left-hand side of my calendar page is tracking my mood. <laughs> um, I do have alexithymia, which for those who don't know, is difficulty in recognizing and processing um, your feelings and your emotions. I find it hard to know how I'm feeling um, it's something I think that's common in a lot of autistic people, um, and possibly other neurodivergencies as well. Um, and so, I don't know if you can hear all of that horn beeping outside, I'm so sorry. Literally, why? <laughs> um, so I track my mood. This is something I started this year for my Hobonichi after I saw a similar thing on Pinterest. Um, and it's interesting because my, the moods I've written down are like okay, uh, tired, productive, and migraine, like those are my four moods that I've written down for myself to track, and this is because I struggle to identify other feelings. I, I often feel tired, and I think that that's an okay mood to track. I never want to put anything too negative, I never want to write bad or, or good as an overly positive, because I struggle to identify those. I find it a lot easier to navigate in something a bit gentler. I find it a lot easier to think, okay, I've had an okay day, or I've had a day where I've been tired and that means I've been struggling, but I would never want it to be bad because so much of my life is being just okay or tired and struggling. 
I think if I had to split it into happy and sad, it would it would really start to get to me. So I track okay and I track tired and I track productive because I think that's nice to acknowledge. And then I also track migraines for, for a medical thing. Um, I am medicated for migraines. So I track these for my doctor and for myself. Um, so that's more of like a medical thing. But tired, okay and productive are the three moods that I feel comfortable recognizing and acknowledging and then documenting. Um, so so yeah, I do have alexithymia. I don't know how I'm feeling. <laughs> um, it's a joke in my family that every time you ask me how I am, I just say tired because I, I don't know. I'm not sure what else to say. Um, and then if people ask you how you are and you're maybe not doing so good, you then start to come to that autistic confusion standpoint where you're like, how much do they want to know? Um, so even as a child, I always just found it easier to say tired than anything else because otherwise you run the risk of either oversharing um, or coming across a bit strange um, or maybe just taking the question too seriously, I guess. Um, either that or oversharing with someone who's not equipped to talk about it. So, yeah, I do have alexithymia and I am currently mood tracking just to help see when I'm going through low periods, basically. Um, I actually finished therapy last year. I think I've been out of therapy now for almost a year, actually. But my shrink did say <laughs> um, if I ever were struggling again, then just to text her and we'll go back to it. So it feels important for me as part of my post-therapy care to track my moods, generally speaking. So that if I start to get too many tired or migraine days in a row, I know that maybe it's time to give my shrink a text <laughs> um, to make sure that I'm looking after myself. Um, and then another quick question for this day. Do you ever share or show your friends or family any of your entries? Um, and no, not really, to be honest. I think my grandmother watches most of my videos. Um, hi, Nana, if you're watching. Um, so she sees them and I think she's actually starting to keep her own commonplace book now, which is really exciting. Um, but the rest of my family, because they've been around for so much of my life, I don't think they really care in like the nicest way possible. That's not like a, a diss. They just don't care. Like they've seen so much of it and they've seen me do it for so many years that I just don't think they're interested. And they also have to listen to me chat pure shit all day at them. <laughs> so I think they've just had enough. Um, I can't really imagine them wanting to sit down and look at it. As, as well as talking to me all day um, and that's like a nice thing not a self-deprecating thing like they live with me they know me so they don't really I guess have the impulse to look at my books um, so no not really <laughs> same with my friends too like they've been around them so long I think they just blend in with me um, they just see them as an extension of me that they already know I guess um, so no not really um, in this last segment here, I'm just working on my commonplace book. I was just making some work notes, I think, about my ghost pages. Um, I just was really feeling the ghost pages, you guys. I, I really just wanted to draw ghosts on Tuesday. Um, and I was actually still doing it on Wednesday. So we have that to look forward to. I realised belatedly I probably could have recorded it and just included my sketchbook as one of the books I was working in. Um, but I didn't. I was working on it hunched up on the sofa like a gremlin. So, Wednesday was the day that I was meant to go out and run some errands and maybe I should have because I ran them on Thursday and it didn't go well but no spoilers. On Wednesday I was home alone because Wednesday the dog <laughs> goes to daycare on Wednesday the day um, so she wasn't home. It's normally a day when I do go out and run errands but this time I just decided to work quietly at home because I was a bit tired. Um, I was working in my commonplace book. Here I'm cutting out a picture of Shep from Animal Crossing. Um, I don't think I even used it in the end, but I wanted him for something that I couldn't remember afterwards. And then I printed the ghosts I was working on and I stuck those in my commonplace book and I wrote about them. Um, it was just an extension of Ghost Tuesday. So there we go. I was working on ghosts. Um, I want to make them into stickers. So this was like, I tricked myself into thinking this was like a work task. It was like a, like a research task. Um, but it was really just self-indulgence. <laughs> the next question is, does the little house drawing mean anything? I noticed that it is a recurring motif. Um, and I do draw it later. Oh, I drew it on this day. I thought I recorded it. Um, maybe I draw them again later. I thought I had that footage. I'm gonna look for it in my phone. <laughs> um, 
I do draw the house a lot and this is a question that I answered recently on Tumblr so what I'm gonna do is just pop that on screen because it's very personal and I don't really want to try and talk about it out loud because it's kind of embarrassing um, but if you want to read it you can pause it and have a quick look or you can come back to it but that is why I draw them <laughs> um, and then the next question after that is where do you get the information you copy down from? Sometimes you say that you copy down an article. Does that mean from newspapers and magazines or books? Can you give any recommendations on what you like to read? Um, all of the above except newspapers because newspapers in the UK really aren't worth reading. Um, there's nothing in them of any use to anybody. So I do read magazines. Um, I shop around. Um, I'm not really loyal to any particular magazine because I find that I don't like any of them consistently. I quite like The Idler, but not always. Um, I like... What else do I like? I used to buy Granta, which was a writing magazine. It would release quarterly, I think, and it would have short stories and stuff in it, or just research projects that had been written out, and it was really, really cool. I really enjoyed that, but WH Smith stopped selling them near me. Um, which is a bit cursed. <laughs> um, I sometimes read New Scientist. I'm a big fan of New Scientist. I've been reading that for years. Um, although, again, not recently. I kind of stopped reading during COVID um, for obvious reasons. Um, although I did follow some of the progression. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I do read magazines. I will try and put a list in the comments because I'm blanking on it a bit. Um, but otherwise, I find a lot of quotes on Tumblr and Pinterest, I hate to say it, but people do share a lot of cool quotes on there, so I find a lot on there. Um, and then the other place is just from reading books as well. Um, I read a lot of non-fiction as well as fiction, I just don't always talk about it, um, so sometimes I get text from there as well. Um, basically, I pick text up from wherever I'm reading, whether that's online, in person, in books, in magazines, um, or sometimes even just things I've heard on the radio and stuff. Um, podcasts is another cool place. Sometimes I'll hear something in a podcast and then I'll research it in my own time and then I'll make notes from that. So it's like that kind of thing. Like I'm just someone who likes to always be learning. <laughs> so naturally I come across a lot of information and then I don't want to lose it. I have memory problems and I don't want to lose it. So I write it down and I think sometimes that helps it stick better. Um, so I hope, I hope that makes sense. And then another question for this day, what is your favorite kind of grid? I think that's the English word, I'm not sure. Like, do you prefer lines, dots, blank or squared pages? Um, and that does make sense, you're right. Um, my favorite type of paper or guide, I guess you would call it like a guide on the paper maybe, um, is squares. Um, <laughs> spoiler, um, everyone is pretending to be shocked. I do like squares. That's why when the Leuchtturm notebooks changed their grid to darker, I was so devastated because I love the squares. The dots are fine. I would say my hierarchy is graph paper, so squares, then dots, then lines, then blank. Um, I never ever use blank paper, not even when I was in art school did I like blank paper. I love having a texture already there, um, and I think that some graph paper is just like chef's kiss, the best one. Um, I do I do love a graph. <laughs> um, so squares, and that's why I think I love Field Notes and Hobonichi so much, is because of that graph paper. If I could fix anything about the Hobonichi weeks, it would be to have that very pale graph paper on the left-hand page in the weeks, because that's blank, and I have to like basically trace my own writing underneath to use it as a guideline. I'm really bad at writing straight on blank paper, I guess because of lack of practice. So if there was one thing I could change about the Hobonichi weeks, I want the squares on the left-hand side as well. I'm not sure why they're not there, but I want them, <laughs> so. I was writing about my ghosts for a long time, and then after I did that, I had some photos arrive, which was really exciting. I thought that I would include it. Um, I've been thinking a lot more about printing photos again. Um, obviously, I talked about Instax in my last video, but the quality isn't very good, and I just don't really like it. So I was thinking about printing them, not traditionally, but, you know, getting prints made. Um, just small ones for my own for my own use. Um, so I was testing this company called Free Prints, and they're pretty good. I liked them. I got the photos printed matte, um, and I really like it. I've been thinking a lot about the tactility of holding photographs and looking at them and showing them to people. I think it's very different than looking at a screen, um, and often the quality from a home printer isn't really good enough. 
so I thought I would show these to you since they arrived while I was working. Um, and it's, it's nice, I'm happy with them. Thursday was the day that I chose to run errands this week. I needed to post my most recent roll of film off to be developed. I use an independent development studio in Leeds that I really like. They're called Take It Easy um, and they're great. So I post it to them. Um, here I'm getting the film ready to be posted, I guess, and loading a new roll in. I haven't actually been shooting film recently because it's been so expensive. It's been like a year or so, maybe even a year and a half, maybe two years. So I was a bit confused rolling this in. Normally when you have a film camera, there's a little hook on the spool for your for your film and I couldn't find the hook and I was so baffled. Um, but because the camera I use, it's an Olympus Mew 2, um, because it's an, a point and shoot and it's electric, it automatically loads the film. <laughs> so I was a bit like confused. I cut out like two minutes of me looking for the hook. Um, it rolls itself. Um, and this moment here where I'm just staring is when it's, I could hear it wiring in basically, and then I opened it up to check it, it loaded, and then I couldn't remember what it was supposed to look like when it was loaded properly, so the whole thing was just silly. Anyway, it was fine, you'll be glad to know I shot pictures this day and it's working fine. <laughs> um, this day did not go as planned, I wanted to take you with me, I thought it would be cute to go like stationary shopping, I wanted to buy some mini envelopes, and I wanted to buy a new pencil case maybe. I went and I posted my film, all fine, but the WH Smith, like, they used to have a section um, from a shop called Typo, which is, like, a stationery store in the UK. It's quite cute. It's just gone. <laughs> like, it just disappeared. Um, they're putting some kind of kids section there now, and I was like, oh, okay. So I thought it was going to be really easy to find a cute pencil case, and it wasn't. I went to Miniso, I went to Tiger, I went to the range. I walked all the way to the range, had a terrible time. They didn't have it either. They also had no mini envelopes in WH Smith which is where I bought them for my Halloween project. They just didn't have them anymore. So I was looking for those in all the same places. No, I had either of these things. What I thought was gonna be a really cute, like stationary trip was terrible. I walked around for like four hours and because I couldn't find what I needed, aut autistically speaking, I just got really baffled. I was so confused and a bit disoriented. And so I walked around for ages looking at things, couldn't find anything I needed. In the end, I just went to the supermarket and bought some granola. Like, the panic was real, the autistic panic was real. Um, so here I started filming a cute video. I was like, it's gonna be nice, I'm gonna take photos, it's gonna be a nice day. We're gonna go stationary shopping. And it just didn't happen. Um, I did see some swans. I did take some really nice photos because I was going home during the sunset, so I took some photos on my new roll of film. Um, I did not find a pencil case. <laughs> I did not find a pencil case. Um, these were the ones I saw in Miniso, not really very cute, and they felt kind of cheap. Um, and they were all just very not nice. Um, in Tiger, they had this one, and then they had like a canvas one, but the zip was pink, and I didn't like that. Yeah, pink zip. Um, didn't like that. And then they had like a yellow one down the end, and I was like, why? So I got granola, and then I just went home, basically. I got groceries, and I left. And I came home confused as hell. So that was Thursday. The next question was, in this or future videos, I'd love to hear more about how you catch up on your books when you miss a few days, especially when it comes to commonplace entries. Are you casually slash quickly gathering information some other way, perhaps digitally, before it goes into your books? Or are you engaging with print, other sources, when they come to mind as you're writing in your books? Um, and I think the answer is a bit of both. Um, on screen right now, I'm just doing a little flip through of my current commonplace book for you. Um, and I think the answer has to be both. I sometimes will read an article and either be busy um, or be downstairs without my books if they're upstairs. Um, often when I'm downstairs, Wednesday is literally sleeping on my lap, so I don't just want to get up and go and get things. Um, if she's settled, I try to let her be. Um, so <clears throat> if that's the case, I will normally bookmark it if it's an online thing and come back to it. Sometimes at the weekends, I'll sit down and write like quite a few entries in my commonplace book. Um, so I do bookmark things online. Um, if they're paper things, sometimes I will take a picture of the article if I don't want to pay for the magazine when I'm in the shops. Sometimes I will take a picture of the article pages um, and then copy it down from my phone when I get home. Um, 
I don't think that's very fair, but, you know, things cost a lot at the moment, so we do what we can. Um, otherwise, sometimes I will take a clipping, and I'll keep the clipping until I'm ready to write it down. Um, and sometimes I'll even stick the clipping itself in instead. Um, so I am casually gathering information. I wouldn't really say quickly, but I am casually gathering information, and I do like capture it for later I guess by bookmarking it or taking a photo or something um and then I often will sit down and have like a commonplace session if I if I want to if I need to if I feel like I have a lot to catch up on um otherwise some things just stay in my bookmarks sometimes things end up not really being as important as I thought they would be to keep um and I try to think that that's fine too and sometimes I come back across them later and they feel more important then and then I'll write them down then um, so it's a, it's a bit of give and take, if that makes sense. It's a bit of push and pull. Um, it's kind of just going with my instinct on it. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, I don't know. I bookmark things and I, I, I hold on to them for later sometimes. Other times, if I'm really in the mood and I see something and I'm very inspired, I'll put everything down to write it down then and there. Um, but to be honest, I think it is more common that I bookmark it for later, just because I'm normally working on so many things at once when I'm at home. Um, it's just not always practical to put it down to spend 20 minutes writing out a four-page article. Um, so, so yeah, I do, I do collect information for later. Um, the next question was, would love to know how you can use journaling slash other methods to heal from a meltdown. Um, and I think journaling is, is the one for this. It's not so much planning, although... If the meltdown is caused by being overwhelmed by the things on your plate, I think planning could be another another good thing. For example, I had a meltdown about my taxes <laughs> because taxes are scary and I have dyscalculia, um, which is numerical dyslexia. I had a meltdown about my taxes because they're really intimidating when you consider that it's all numbers and if you mess it up, you go to jail. Um, it's scary. However, when I sat with my dad and we broke it down into smaller tasks, it became a lot more manageable and it helped me to recover and feel better a lot faster than I would have if I had kept procrastinating it. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, otherwise, though, journaling is a big help. I think this is why I originally got into journaling was because I was so overwhelmed with so much of my life, especially because I grew up undiagnosed. Um, I found that if I wrote down everything that I was struggling with and how I was feeling and you know, if you're just very honest on paper, <laughs> um, I think it's cathartic, I really do. Journaling has always helped me to feel better, um, it's always helped me to get it out of my head. I find that if I sit down and write about something, I can, I can put it down. Um, otherwise I feel like I'm always thinking about so many things and I feel so overwhelmed, but if I write it down, it gives me an outlet and I can take some of that pressure off that one particular thing. Um, so I think just writing down how you felt about the meltdown, what you think caused it, what you think you could do to prevent it in the future, um, just writing about how overwhelmed you are and how unfair the world is. All of these things are cathartic and helpful in some way. I don't think you can really go wrong with writing things down. I think it's always helpful. Um, and if you're worried about people reading it, when I was a kid, I would write down what I was feeling and then I would use a black felt tip to scribble it all back out. <laughs> I would go along and I would scribble out each individual word and that in itself was a second catharsis that was also immensely helpful because the act of scribbling it out like erasing these things was was very helpful for me so you could do that too <laughs> um, otherwise you can just put your book under your mattress that's where we hide things so that's another option um someone else said how much time do you spend in your notebooks usually in a day i'm asking because i can spend up to five hours in mine that's it that's very impressive that's incredible kudos for that um i normally spend probably between 20 minutes and an hour um at the weekend if i'm doing like a proper commonplace session i could probably do more um but generally speaking day to day probably like 20 minutes um in each book to be fair um Sometimes my planner only takes five or six minutes to update, but my commonplace book could be a lot longer. Um, as I said before, I do dip in and out of both books very frequently, so I think it's harder to pin down how much time because I'm constantly just in and out and in and out. Um, but five hours is so impressive. <laughs> I would love to know how much each of you spend in your books. Let me know in the comments how much time you spend in your books every day because I would love to know 
how common five hours is. <laughs> I would love to know what the general time frame people spend is. I think that would be really interesting. Um, and then lastly, someone said, I know you use your journals mainly for commonplacing, but do you use them for anything else, like fun? Like a journal for tracking your reading or things you watch, habit, mood tracker, anything like that. We already talked about my mood tracker, um, but I do also track what I'm watching and reading. And you can see that at the bottom right of these pages on the screen. Here I'm catching up with my daily pages um, and at the bottom of the right hand side there's a line and then under that it says watching and reading. So that's where I write down what I'm watching and reading. Um, this week I rewatched both of the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies and they were really good. So yeah, um, that's where I keep track of that. Everything else fun goes in my commonplace book really. Um, I do need to keep better track of what I'm reading but I normally do that on my monthly page when I'm actually reading. Right now, I'm still procrastinating if we were villains <laughs> um, for the update for the people waiting for that. Um, I, I am still not really reading this week. I think I've just had other stuff on my plate this week, so I've not really sat down to do it. Um, I, I will get there, I swear. I'll, I, I'll pick it up and it'll be done in two days and then we'll be able to talk about it, but I'm not there yet. Um, so, yeah. Um, that is all of the planner questions that I dug out from the comments. I think what I might do now is find you a silly background picture and then answer some more like rapid fire style general questions because I know I have a lot of new subscribers. Hi new subscribers! <laughs> um, I know there's a lot more of you now and there are some very general questions that a lot of people want answered. They had like a lot of likes in the community section. So we'll do that next, some rapid fire questions. Obviously, older subscribers and followers don't have to stick around for this if they don't want to. I'm just going to answer some frequently asked questions and also just some fun ones. Um, but no pressure to stick around. If you're busy, you have things to do. It's cool. I promise I won't hold it against you. Um, the first question is, what is your favourite candle scent? Um, and definitely spiced things. I really like Christmas and autumn candles, fall candles. Um, I like pumpkin spice type smells if they're not too sweet. But mostly I like things like cinnamon um, and sometimes coffee smells um, and I really like my favorite candle of all time is from m and and it comes out of Christmas and it's frankincense and myrrh and it smells amazing it smells like a church in the best way possible um, but otherwise just spiced absolutely spiced clementines and cinnamon and cloves like allspice gingerbread those kinds of smells super good the second question, what are your plans for your birthday? Um, thank you for asking. I am going to go spend it with my brother. I think that'll be nice. Um, and that's all I'll say because I don't want to stalk her. Um, what is your favourite book of all time and why? I think it has to be the All Souls trilogy by Deborah Harkness. These books have their flaws for sure. And I thought the Sky adaptation was okay. I was fine with the casting. I thought the casting was really good. I really liked to see Gala Glass on the big screen. Um, that was really wonderful, um, but I thought that it would have done better if the TV show was longer um, because the books are so big and that's why I love them, the world building and the character building and the lore that gets fleshed out is incredible. I think Deborah Harkness has now actually released like an All Souls universe encyclopedia. Um, if you've never read them or heard of them, please look them up. They do have some flaws, as I said, but I feel like all fantasy does, but the fact that I got to read these three huge books with such deep lore and such wonderful characters and so much world building and they even time travel and the fact that there were vampires as the main characters. I was living. I was it was a really good time for me. <laughs> um I've actually reread them three or four, maybe five times. Um I reread them like every winter. I really love them. Um so I think that has to be my choice. Um Apart from that, Sherlock Holmes books, obviously. People were asking which my favourite Sherlock Holmes book was, but I'm not sure, okay? I often listen to the audiobook, and so it just runs through every single story in, like, one long loop. Um, and so sometimes I just forget which ones are which. Um, but I, I, I can't choose, okay? I love all the Sherlock Holmes books. Maybe not all of them, but I, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I can't connect the titles with the themes, um, but yeah all souls trilogy i love it um someone said as a content creator do you have a process for keeping track of upcoming videos slash projects for art um and the answer is not really 
I'm a mood reader and I'm also a mood creator, <laughs> if you will. I think that's the easiest way for me to describe it. I make the things I feel like making when I feel like making them. I don't ever want to be scheduling content because that's not very like, it doesn't work for me. For me, the idea of scheduling content weeks or months in advance would not feel authentic. And if I'm not enjoying the stuff I'm working on, I just can't do it. So I don't schedule like videos, for example. I will often keep a very loose, vague list of topics I would like to make videos on, but I don't ever schedule them like in the calendar. Um, I just keep a list, a very vague list. Um, and the same for art projects. I only really enjoy working on the things that I want to make at the time I'm making them. So again, I keep a very vague list, but I don't ever schedule anything, um, which is often why my Halloween projects and stuff can run late. Um, because until I feel ready to work on it, I don't have any ideas. Um, I'm very much like a in the mood, in the moment kind of creator um, for all of all of my creative work. Um, so yeah, unfortunately no schedule, <laughs> um, but I do keep lists and that's it really. Um, I don't really have a process for keeping track of upcoming projects. I just keep a vague list and hope for the best. Um, can you share with us how you film and edit videos and what tools you use? Um, this is, I find this question hilarious, not, not in like a rude way. It's a very sincere question, but I find it so funny because I use my phone and iMovie. <laughs> like that's all I have. Um, this, this channel is like as low budget as you can get. I use my phone for filming and recording audio. I use a tripod thing on my desk to do the top down stuff. It's like a funny clamp arm that clips to the side of my desk. Um, I make my thumbnails in Procreate on my iPad, which is just an extension of my illustration work. Um, and, and I use iMovie on my laptop, which is just the free editing software that comes with Macs. Um, so that's it. It's real low budget over here. Um, I can't afford a camera or a microphone. I could probably afford a microphone. Let me know if you guys want a microphone. Um, I like my videos to be very low maintenance, very easy to make so that I can make things very quickly when I feel like it, as I said, because I'm a mood creator, if you will. Um, I, I like how accessible it makes it. I like that I don't have to spend a very long time setting up a camera or a microphone or a really fancy tripod or using really laborious editing software. I like that it's it's so low key um, and, and you guys are very complimentary and the fact that people think I'm using better equipment than I am is kind of amazing to me. I hope that means that they come across as higher quality than they are. Um, but let me know if you if you want a microphone. The only thing that concerns me with a microphone is that I think my phone microphone can avoid picking up some of my asthmatic breathing. If I had an actual microphone, I think it would pick up a lot more sound, um, which is, as an asthmatic, is a horrifying prospect. Um, I'm quite new to your videos, but what are your supplies for cho of choice for illustration? Um, and I mentioned this in the last episode of the Attic Archives, episode 32. Um, I only work digitally, so I only use Procreate on my iPad, that's it. That's literally it. I've been that way for four or five years now, maybe more. Um, I, I just really love working that way, and so that's the only way I work. <laughs> um, I will say that, to my detriment, I am kind of a technophobe. I do really struggle with new things, I guess, because I'm autistic. Um, but also, just generally speaking, I do struggle with trying to learn new software, and I don't enjoy the process. It really stresses me out. I like that when I use Procreate, everything is where it is always, and it's easy to pick up, and it's it's very effortless to use, it's very intuitive. Um, it's like the complete opposite of Photoshop in that respect. Um, as someone who didn't grow up with Photoshop because they couldn't afford it, Procreate feels a lot friendlier. Um, and I've had Procreate since it was free, so I've had it a long time now. Um, and every time I see a screenshot of Photoshop, it just looks so complicated. And I just remember being in uni and it costing so much to keep my subscription going for my classes. Um, but yeah, I, I'm only a digital illustrator nowadays. I don't faff about with traditional anymore just because I don't enjoy it. Um, so just Procreate and my iPad. Um, Procreate, if you're watching this and you want to sponsor me, please, please sponsor me. <laughs> um, I've been subscribed for a while, but I feel like I still don't know much about your illustrations in Sticker Shop. I'd love to hear about your journey into creating products and how you learned illustration. Um, and similarly, I think somebody asked me how I ended up as an illustrator, um, like how I chose to make art my career. 
Um, and so <laughs> basically when I was in school, I was not diagnosed. I was an undiagnosed autistic. I was also very, very poorly in other ways, both mentally and physically. Basically, I was at my absolute rock bottom in high school um, and in college. So I flunked out of every single class but art, basically. I don't have a maths GCSE for any British people watching. <laughs> um, I, I, I can't emphasize just how badly I was failing my way out of school um, because I was too ill to keep up in, in every aspect of my life, basically. <laughs> um, so I chose art because it was my only option. But thankfully, I did also really enjoy it. Um, it was something that I was always very inclined towards anyway. Um, so when I realised it was my only option, it was kind of like, a, okay, this is my only choice, but also it's kind of a no-brainer for me. So I took art. Um, in college, I was really lucky to have really good tutors who then helped guide me through the process of applying to university. Um, honestly, I think back on how nice my college tutors were and... I, I feel bad that I, I didn't thank them more because I was going through so much stuff in my own life as a 17 year old that I don't think I ever actually sat down and thanked them properly for what they did for me because without them I wouldn't have gone to university and then I don't know where I would be. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think about that a lot. Um, but thankfully I did get into university so I went to art school. I took a BA, a bachelor's in illustration um, and, and then I did three intense years of drawing um, and then when I graduated I knew that because I'm autistic and I have issues with my energy levels I couldn't really work for a company or a design in-house. I knew that any kind of in-house illustration work where I had to work some kind of nine to five in an office or at home wasn't going to work for me. Um, I actually still now really struggle with client work because of the communication and the keeping on top of the scheduling. Um, these are things autistically that I find very difficult um, so choosing to go freelance again, it was like an only option kind of scenario. I knew that I had to give it a really good go and see if I could make something of it because I wasn't sure what my alternative was. Um, I couldn't see an alternative where I was drawing and healthy and, and working for someone. Like those three things were not going to happen. Um, so that's kind of how, how it happened. Um, so part of my freelance work is making videos. Part of my freelance work is running my Patreon page, which is kind of like a newsletter, really. Um, I don't do a lot of updating there. I just like to dip in and out and drop things off every now and then when I'm working on them. Um, and part of my illustration work is running my online shop as well, um, which is where I sell like stickers and tote bags and zines. I make a lot of zines, <laughs> um, admittedly not recently because I've been a bit burnt out. Um, but normally I make quite a lot of zines and I sell those as well. Um, and then the last part of my illustration work, my freelance work, is like client work, which I do more rarely, but a couple of times a year, maybe three or four times a year. Um, yeah, that is that is my, my illustration journey, <laughs> I guess. Um, I'm still very young in it, I think. My career is only like a three or four years old, um, so I'm still learning a lot. I still have a very steep learning curve ahead of me. Um, I am still just a baby illustrator, really. Um, but to be honest, while we're here talking about it, I think YouTube has been a really exciting development for me, um, autistically and creatively speaking, because it's something that gives me a different creative outlet to drawing. It's allowed me to take on less client work, which, as I said, is really difficult for me, um, because it, I can make income from YouTube <laughs> um, to help kind of, like, fade some of the client work out, um, which lets me rest a bit more and work more on my own terms, which is always the goal. Um, autistically speaking, that's always going to be the best thing for me. Um, so it's been a really exciting year. We're coming off on a whole year of the channel. Um, and it's, it's been really nice to be able to focus more on videos and see the payoff, um, both literally and also like in a more general way. Um, it's been so exciting to connect with so many people and stuff and also pay bills <laughs> so that's cool um uh two more questions i'll answer did you plan out your tattoos um or do you add them as you go also how covered are you willing slash wanting to be um i did vaguely plan some of them i have a saint anthony coin on my arm which i always knew i was gonna get and my john and sherlock on the back of my arm i knew i was always gonna get 
and then a couple of my other ones I saw them and I was like oh that's so cool I would like to have that on my body <laughs> and then I got them um as far as how covered I want to be not very I don't think I don't think I ever want full sleeves or legs or anything um I try to keep them quite smallish um although not so much recently um and often keeping this small can be a detriment to yourself I don't really recommend it because they'll fade more with age um which I wish I had realized earlier but when I got a couple of my very early ones I was so nervous about my family finding out about them that I wanted them to be small and hideable um which again I don't really recommend as a logical course of action um but I don't want to be that covered I think I could get a couple more but probably not more than that and then the last question because I have talked for an extra 14 minutes um do you have any favorite comfort shows or films that make you feel better on a bad day Constantine 2005 <laughs> um this is this is my favorite movie Constantine 2005 is so good I love it I do also really like the Constantine TV show, just in case anyone is wondering, but the Constantine movie has such a place in my heart. Um, I will watch it twice a day, every day, if I want to, so Constantine 2005. Um, apart from that, I really like a lot of those early 2000s bad, in air quotes, films. Um, I'm thinking about things like Dracula 2000 um and and films along that vein the kind of like supernaturally ones like that the the funny supernatural renaissance of the 90s and 2000s queen of the damned is so good like i when lestat is in the band like oh my god okay those kinds of films are my favorites um i could watch them all day they're peak comfort for me just the the, the vampires and the the supernaturally elements i think tilda swinton as gabriel and Constantine was chef's kiss that was a casting um, obviously Keanu Reeves, like the whole casting, Rachel Weisz, like I just, those, that's a good movie man, that's a good movie, um, so Constantine 2005, that's the one for me, um, shows, I just watched BBC Sherlock, it's trash but it's my trash, um, I think, I think that's a comfort show that I unfortunately can't move past, having said that, I do also really love Elementary, which is like the American Sherlock, um, I do really enjoy that and I think that 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 um Sherlock and Joan was so good I really love Lucy Liu as Joan I think she did an absolutely phenomenal job she was the best and strongest Joan out of Ed Joan John out of any of them um so there there we go okay my voice is getting kind of wavy I think I'm gonna lose it <laughs> um so I'll leave it there thank you if you stuck around for the extra 15 minutes um I hope I hope you enjoyed the rapid fire Q&A at the end um, you all tell me that you like the the voice segments, so you better not be lying to me. <laughs> um, if you got to the end, prove it by telling me your favourite comfort shows or films, because I could probably do with some new ones. Um, otherwise, I think the universe is going to like revoke Constantine from me. I think someone's going to intervene. <laughs> um, it'll probably get removed off Netflix as like a punishment, so... If you got to the end, tell me your favourite comfort shows and films. Um, other than that, I hope you enjoyed this week's video. Um, please pray for me on Wednesday and all the construction work. Um, and I will see you next week for a normal episodes of the Attic Archives. Take care.